on tonight's episode of the Talking TV Podcast. We've got another tremendous celebrity interview coming up. We're talking to Sugath Varagays of Kim's Convenience and The Expanse fame. It's going to be nuts. I'm already, I'm, I'm super pumped for this and it hasn't even started yet. Of course, I'm Dom the Movie Nerd. I am Chris the TV Nerd. If you guys are just tuning in and joining us, please feel free to ask Sujit the question in the chat. Anything you want, we'll, we'll be sure to work it in. Tonight is all free game, guys. Cannot wait to share this with you. Dom. We're, we're, we're going to be talking about it all. This, this guy's got a long career and we're yeah. very excited to get into it. So all that and more covered on tonight's episode. All right, good to see StreamYards up to its usual tricks. What's going on, guys? Uh, Sugit, happy to have you here, dude. This I, I is, love your theme song. There. Oh, it's it's great, isn't it? Now, uh, all uh, props to this guy. All Dom props to this guy right here. Getting my uh, surname correct, and Chris wins the prize for getting my first name correct. Awesome. Between yes. the three, you got it right. Perfect. <laughs> Hell now yeah, you understand man. why we're a duo. <laughs> we, we need each other. You're like the perfect two-headed interviewer. That's just, hey, that's thank you, you so much, man. And we that? haven't even really gotten started yet. Well, what's funny about that is that that's literally what every person has said about us since we started interviewing. Specifically, that goes all the way back to our first interview guest, Jeff Bryan of Survivor, who literally said that about us. Like after he was on, he's like, "Yeah, you guys make the perfect pair." Is like because Chris is just down to earth enough to contain my energy, and, he, and I'm like, well, "Yeah, I'm, that, that basically what, something." Just from what you guys did with my name. I know. Well, that's how. It's yes. <laughs> now, now you understand. We no. Now you understand why this show does not work if it's just one of us involved. So, Sujith, man, speaking of your name, it's it's something that's been popping into my my zeitgeist radar, as I like to call it, quite a lot recently. Um, I am a huge fan of a little show, not not so little anymore. Let's just be honest. Called Kim's Convenience. It is my number one go to before bed sitcom at this point in my life. Meaning, I binge it endlessly because I love it so much. And then I found out you were on The Expanse. And then I realized that you have a history of writing in your past. And then I thought, hey, we got to speak to this guy if he's willing enough to come on the show, because it really seems like you figured out a way to create your own and forge your own career in the arts, the performing arts, rather, which is such a competitive and difficult field. So if you could take us back to sort of and, and work your way through to present day, like what was your first inspiration? You know, when was when did you first like sort of trek out and know this was like your path and, and sort of spare no expense, like any detail is welcomed here. We love to kind of know the Sujith story. So I, I was born in India and my family came to Canada when I was a year old. So I grew up in actually I grew up in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, uh, which is not the showbiz capital of the world. And, uh, and so, um, I ended up, uh, I don't know why really, other than it just worked out this way, but I ended up, you know, I'm a son of immigrants, Indian background. What do you do when you go to university? Pre-med. So I was a pre-med student, but, uh, I also ticked off drama. And so I was the first pre-med drama double major at the University of Saskatchewan. So I did all the pre-med classes, I did all the drama classes, and then I realized I wanted to, didn't want to go to medical school right away, because you could back then, you could apply to medical school after one year, and I, it was too soon for me. Uh, luckily, my, you know, my dad was a doctor, his father was a doctor, I got an uncle who was a doctor, I got two cousins who were a doctor, thankfully my younger sister became a doctor, so I was off the hook, and I, I sort of went into the arts, though I didn't really know I was going into the arts professionally, I was just kind of, you know, interested in that in, in university. Uh, and, it, and it goes back to, you know, I did high school plays and I, you know, when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, I did, you know, my parents enrolled me in a creative drama class, God knows why, but it really uh, somehow mattered to me, you know, as a, as a kid, as a, and at that time I was the only brown kid in my school and I guess it allowed me to feel like I belonged in some way because I wasn't really good at sports. And, and sort of that's where I felt, okay, this is something I like to do. And it just, you know, unfolded like that as I, as I got older. By the time I was, uh, I graduated from university, 
I'd gone to the University of Minnesota. You know, like I said, Saskatoon wasn't the showbiz capital of the world. Uh, so I went to the States to study theater. And I wanted to get into film school in a graduate film program. I wrote a little script because I didn't have an uncle who was a film producer. I didn't have a movie camera, but I had a typewriter. That's how old I am, uh, but way before computers. So I wrote this little script just as a way to try and get into a film school somewhere. And I got into a film school in Toronto called York University in their graduate program. And because I had written something, I found a way to get it to a producer at the CBC. And uh, they liked my little script. And they invited me to pitch an idea for an episode of a TV series they were producing. So I went in and I was locked in a room and watched this pilot on a VHS tape. And uh, while I was waiting to be unlocked from the room, uh, I came up with an idea for an episode and I sold it. Uh, having never written anything but that little script that I had used as a sample before. And that's how I started in television. I broke in as a writer. Um, a couple of years later, after I'd done my first drama, I got, you know, I pitched another idea for a movie for CBC with to the same producer. And, um, and it was about an Indian Canadian guy who'd grown up here and and so I wrote that, and then we found out that we couldn't cast it because back then there were no brown actors. So they proposed casting a guy named Howie Mandel and painting him brown. And I said, wait a minute. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, that's that, a little questionable. That, he's, he's not Indian, I don't think. Uh, so I begged to have a chance at auditioning for my own movie, and I auditioned, I got the part. And so I started my own movie, and this is like 1983, uh, and uh, that's how I started acting. So since then, I've basically done both acting and writing. Um, some years the writing is up, and some years the acting is up. Lately, it's been acting more than writing, but I am writing some stuff. And uh, and you talk about you know carving a career in the arts. I would say that's why I have a career in the arts, given that I am the least likely. I mean, I got the world's worst show business name. I'm not a handsome white guy. I didn't grow up in an entertainment center. I didn't come from a family of artists. And, you know, the, the reason I had a career in the arts was I diversified. I wrote, I acted, I went to the Canadian Film Center as a director, I directed shorts, I directed kids drama. And I've basically done all three for 30 years. And that's how I have a career in the arts. So, um, it, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I encourage anybody who, it doesn't matter whether you're a brown kid from Saskatoon or not, but anybody, uh, that diversification certainly was the key to my ability to have a career. And I would propose that everybody try and diversify because, you know, all your eggs in one basket is a scary way to get through, uh, uh, make a living. Oh man, just. Oh man, so many different things that I want to unpack there. Just about that. That was that was like an entire life story comprised into like a few sentences. That's insane. Just like insane. So like, I guess kind of like to bounce off of that. Like, what what I guess what what is it that I guess just like kind of drove you so you, you so you you've specialized primarily in acting and writing. So I guess throughout like because I've actually. If, if I have, if I have to be completely honest, that's kind of the area that I'd like to kind of focus in as well for the kind of duration of my career. You know, that's kind of the thing that I've had to break down. There's everyone's like, oh, well, what do you want to focus in in the arts? It's like, I, I don't want to focus necessarily in anything. I want to like learn all these different things that way I can like, cause that's going to like be able to, you know, give me a career and give me all these different options potentially is, you know, the more, you know, you're just better off that way. But I guess kind of my question is. What would you say you're drawn to more with writing and acting? And what do you see as like kind of what is it about each of those respective fields that you feel kind of you, you enjoy about each of them? See, um, and I've said this before, uh, if I had to fill out my passport and say what my profession was, you know, I work as a writer, I work as an actor, I work as a director, uh, I'd put professional storytelling. Because after doing this for a long time, I realized that each of those jobs, writing, acting, directing, it's the same job. And the job is storytelling. And, and if you work in the business, you realize that's the same job for anybody. The costume designer is a storyteller. They're, they're telling the story through clothes. The production designer is a storyteller. They're telling the story through the sets. The, the DOP is a storyteller. He's telling the story through light and, and uh, composition. Uh, uh, so I am a storyteller as a writer 
because I'm working with story on the page. Uh, when I get to direct, now I'm directing with a camera. I mean, I'm storytelling with a camera. And if I'm acting, I'm storytelling in front of the camera. And it's the same job. It requires different skills. And not everybody can do the, all those jobs, at least, and get paid to do them. But uh, I would say anybody who works in the business for some length of time actually understands that that's fundamentally the job that they're doing. And so what I would say to you and anybody who says, how do you do that, is learn to be a storyteller. Because storytelling is what will um, inform how you execute any of those jobs. And if you don't understand story, if you just think, okay, I gotta be cool and pretty and on camera, and that's what acting is, well, you'll have a, a, a brief, maybe successful, but brief career, you know? But if you're able to be a storyteller as an actor, uh, you're gonna be a creative collaborator. You're gonna be able to have a conversation with the director about how you know they're trying to tell the story too, about how to tell the story the most effective way possible, you using your acting uh, job and he you, or she using their directing job. And hopefully the writer has done their storytelling job well enough that you're now lifting that off the page and it becomes uh, you know, a, a team effort. Um, uh, so I would say that's the key. It's, a, it's about learning, understanding, uh, focusing and, and getting expertise at storytelling. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Very, very profound sentiment as well. It's kind of like, right. I'm a, I'm more on the musical side of things. So I'm learning how to do podcast audio editing at the same time as I'm learning music production. And uh, I'm learning how to, you know, work with clients and, and record. You can't stay if you, cause it's very competitive. I think Hollywood kind of does a disservice with how glamorous they make the rolling of the red carpet out to young creators, seeing the glitz, the glamour, you know, the dresses make, I think they, they kind of give a false interpretation of how difficult it is to get to that level you know to be a brad pitt you have to have you jobs know, there, it's not there's just a lot of luck in getting it to any level but particularly that level you know i have a lot of friends and colleagues who are i mean i consider myself extremely lucky i mean i know that that's what i you know i've 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 done the right things in order to be lucky you know what i mean uh, uh I've, I've worked really hard to be this lucky um but there's lots of people who are as talented or probably more talented than me who, who aren't as lucky. And I don't know what to say about it. That's just the way it works. We, you know, I am eternally grateful for the opportunities that I were, was given and, and, uh, and took advantage of, right? So, so I think you're right that, that the glamorous perspective that is painted about the business is completely false. What's interesting is if you watched, you know, we just had the Golden Globes last night. Yeah. And and you watch the Golden Globes and you realize half of those movie stars and TV stars are sitting at home. You know, Jason Sudeikis is in his hoodie. Uh, and, and you realize, oh, you know, they're, they put their pants on one leg at a time just like I do. And fundamentally, that's who everybody who is working in the business are. They're, they're just trying to do a job. Some of us are more successful than others, which has nothing to do with our talent and mostly to do with our luck. But we're just trying to do this job. And we're grateful to have that job because it's a fun job. I mean, I would pay to do my job if I didn't get paid to do it. But, but it's still a job and it requires expertise and skill and training and, uh, you, you know, at the right attitude. Um, you know, one of the things that I say about people who work in this business, because I used to teach a bit at the college level, and I realized that so many of those aspiring kids were not employable because they didn't have the right attitude. It wasn't that they weren't talented. It was that, you know, they had bought into a kind of expectation of I'm a genius or I got, you know, it's a glamorous business or whatever. And, uh, you know, the homework wasn't being done, right? And, and you know, our business is mostly about doing homework. 
Yeah, yeah you know? very, very true. Makes no, sense. You're, 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 you're a hundred percent on the money there. So I guess kind of just walk us through. So kind of, I mean, obviously, again, like you, you just started. You, you got started in what eighty three? You said you got started. So you, you, you've been well, in I this. Sold my first, I sold my first drama, the one that I was locked in the room to pitch. Right. That was nineteen eighty. So yeah. nineteen eighty. Yeah. So you, you've been in this business a long time. You've been, you've been in this business now. Like that, that makes it like 40, 41 years. As you, you've been doing this a long time. So like, kind of. I, I am guess, a pioneer. Yeah, I was about to say, no, I'm just, I'm, if we had the time, like, I would go through, like, each and every bit of your filmography underway there, but kind of walk us through, so, obviously, um, what's it called, so you landed The Expanse first, right, before Kim's, because you've been involved with, even though you just got cast. Uh, well, involved. it's hard to time it, because I, I started uh, on Kim's, you know, in season one, and it's about the same time that I started on The Expanse, but I wasn't on camera. Right. Uh, I, the, when The Expanse started... I was hired to be one of the background voices. It's a job called looping. And this is what I talk about diversification. I mean, it's not a movie star job. There are people who spend their whole careers just doing looping. And I actually have been looping since, I don't know, the early 90s. On I've done whole seasons of TV series since then. And I think that's why, the, why they asked me to be one of the group that they brought in to do the Expanse loop, loop job. Uh, so I've been looping The Expanse since the pilot. So it's about the same time when The Expanse started because they're in season five and Kim's Convenience started and they're in season five now. So, yeah, it's about the same time. Got I don't it. know which was first, though. Got it. Yeah. So as, as far as the looping goes, kind of like so you've said you've worked on a lot of other shows. Like, are there any shows that like uh, any shows that we would know of that you've done loops for? Uh, shows like Flashpoint. uh Anne of Green Gables, uh, you know, uh, Forever Night, which was a vampire show in the early 90s. I mean, you name it. Wow, I mean, that's, you know. that, that's crazy. So, uh, again, like that that's just how you end up getting the expanse because, again, just like that network that you formed. And, again, you, you're doing it for so long. Obviously, you know, you. Uh, well, it's a, it's a skill set uh, that is pretty unique because you have to be able to improvise on cue without knowing really what's going on. And also, in, on occasion – match what somebody on screen like somebody in the background so you have the cop of the police station they've got a bunch of people in the background while the while brad pitt and you know somebody are talking in the foreground like this there's 25 people in the background you've got to pick that one guy with the white hair and match his lip movements making sense with what you're saying but it's never really heard clearly right because yeah. you know, brad pitt's dialogue is prominent but I always said if you turned up the mix in a different way, it'd still be an interesting story. It would be. It's, you know, it's true making, because every, every single one of those person, what they're saying matters. That so, makes sense. Yeah. You can't so, just say just stupid stuff. You got to actually talk about the forensics or the report has to go up to the DA or whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, all that stuff is important. <laughs> but in sync with however this background person on the day moved their lips. So, you know, true. It's, yeah. not, it's not a job that that everybody can do. And so if you are able to do it, you get to do it a lot. No, totally. I think that this is, I didn't expect it to start off this way, but I'm, I feel inspired. I mean, I want to yeah. go write a song right after this. You know, I think this is really cool information for people who like Dom and a bunch of our peers who want to sort of break into the realm that you've been in for quite some time. And, and before we get too far away from your origins, one last thing I kind of wanted to ask you, and then we're going to talk about all like the really fun stuff. Why I'm sure people are here, you know, the Expanse, Kim's Convenience, and 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 you have a few well, other shows. You know, too, I used to write for the Muppets. I, I was going to say what? that too. I was going to say Fraggle Rock wrote, as well. I, wrote a, I was one of the original writers for a TV series called Fraggle Rock. Oh my God, that's three, insane! Five years ago, yeah, I wrote ten episodes of Fraggle Holy Rock. Jim, Jim directed one of my shows. That's that's insane! Wow. Oh my God! <laughs> so before we uh, before we get too far away from your early years, because we we got a lot to talk about. Yeah, I am curious about what it was like working as a creative professional in Canada, being so close to the United States. Uh, you you stayed in Canada, right? You didn't ever move to LA. Was that yeah. difficult to sort of you know make a career out of it? Because now the Canadian film industry, you have shows like Letter Kenny, and of course Shit's Creek kind of open the floodgates and and now canada i would say isn't just the place that like the cw shows go to to shoot and produce they have amazing content being produced and written in the country itself but i'm, I'm sure it had to be one of the many challenges that you faced early on so what was sort of like your decision making there and and was it as hard, as hard to I, navigate as i'm saying or i did seriously consider uh trying to get a green card to move to uh, Los Angeles in the mid uh, '90s. And, you know, it's one of these things where sometimes life d 
does what it does. I was born in India and I'm a Canadian citizen. So I'd go to the US consulate in Toronto to apply for a green card. And that year they wouldn't let Indian, the people born in India apply because they would always change who was eligible each year. So that year Indian uh, nationals couldn't apply. All right, so I come back next year and that year, Canadian citizens couldn't, couldn't apply. Wow. So after this goes on, so, you were just getting you know, done dirty all around. Coddled, like for four or five years, I, you know, I sort of grew to established here to sort of throw that all away then and, and, and move. But uh, a lot of people do uh, make the move and, and a lot of writers sadly are, I think, uh, moving to, to LA and finding more success because the shows that are shot in Canada end up being written in LA uh, so, and they're all working on those. So I think it's a big tragedy that that uh, brain drain, talent drain continues. Um, it's interesting with COVID that that kind of stopped things happening for a while, but it probably will re revamp once, once we're through this. Um, and, you know, it's difficult to say if you're, I mean, I would say if you're a writer, it's very tempting to consider moving to LA just because of how the business works. If you're an actor, um, you know, if I was talking to somebody in their late twenties, early thirties who had done, you know, 10 or 20 shows in Canada, uh, you know, have a 10 or, 10 or 20 credits in Canada, I'd say, you know, you should consider it if you're talking professionally. For me, it wasn't just a professional decision. It was also a lifestyle decision. It was things were, you know, good enough in Canada that I just sort of toughed it out. Um, and now it's uh, it's pretty good. So I'm not uh, I'm not making any plans to move. But I totally understand people who do. Yeah, for sure, no, definitely. Um, yeah. So kind of walk us through. So you said so you got Kim's um, as around the same time that you did the Expanse. So I guess kind of. Walk us through the, I guess, so I mean, you walk, walked us through how you got the expand. So now, I guess, walk us through the process of how you ended up landing on Kim's. Well, I had done, um, I think Kim's is my third CBC sitcom. Uh, and I had been called in to audition for a part when the series was about to start filming, which I didn't get. It was a friend of Mr. Kim's, and I didn't get that part. You know, it happens. I, I licked my wounds and went on to something else. And then about halfway through season one, they called my agent and said, there's this other part and we're going to show the network his original audition. And if they like it, he'll come in and do that. It's one episode. It'll do that other part, who was also a friend of Mr. Kim's. So that's what happened. They called the next day and said, OK, uh, we'll, we'll have him do this other part, Mr. Meta. And uh, I went in and we did a, a, a rehearsal. I rehearsed with Paul for half an hour a few days later. And Paul and I had worked, it turned out, on a, on a movie um, about six months earlier. We're, we're both barely in this movie, but we spent a night out uh, on a street because it was a big accident scene. He played the cop, I played the drunk driver, and but the camera was really on the leads of the movie and we were like in the background. So we basically spent a night improvising a whole little movie of our, of our own just to amuse ourselves. So I knew Paul really well at that by the time I went in to meet him for Kim's and we had instant chemistry. I, I, I appear, I, I, it appears. And as soon as we finished the rehearsal, they called and said, okay, uh, we want to book him for two more episodes. And when I got the scripts for those two episodes, I realized that the dialogue was the same as the original character I auditioned for and didn't get. So clearly something had happened on the creative side that, they cast somebody and they didn't really have the chemistry that they had hoped for. And so they called me in and I ended up, you know, now I've done 20, 30 episodes of Kim's Convenience doing this part in Mr. Meta. So it worked out. Yeah, it's it, again, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, like I said, I worked really hard to get lucky. Yeah, no, it's really funny that you bring that up because I've been. I, it's funny we had we had John Eck, um, another star of the show, on a couple weeks ago, and we were. T I was telling him I listened to um the the Talking Sopranos podcast, which is Steve Sharipa and Michael Imperioli, two of the stars of the Sopranos, are breaking down that show and going through each episode week by week. And the the amount of times that I have heard now about that whenever they audition a new actor for a part, and an actor comes in, and they may not get the part. 
but that they auditioned for, but the director or the casting agent liked the actor so much that they end up putting the actor in a different part, and the actor usually ends up getting some of the same dialogue that they've usually already read. They just don't. It's just been modified towards them because it's modified for the actor. You know, it's just certain of these little things that I'm starting to notice as I'm like I mean, hearing more and more about the business. So, uh, TV is often a work in progress. So they they threw the they rolled the dice on somebody originally and. Uh, you know, it didn't work out. So they knew who, what I could do, and they they just rolled the dice again, um, and it, and they worked out this time. So I, you know, sometimes these things are really a big orchestrated plan, and sometimes it just, you know, they make it up as they go along. Yeah, totally. I mean, one of my favorite shows is Lost. I don't know how familiar you are with the production behind that type of show, but I feel like you just essentially hit the nail on the head there with uh, the whole, you know, the creators wanted to end it after three seasons. The network said, no, we're, we're booking you for nine, and they had to settle somewhere in the middle at six. And it's just kind of... They never explained the damn polar bear. Nope. They never explained <laughs> the goddamn <laughs> polar bear. Thank you. Oh, man. Hey, they tried. You know, they, they came up with the zoo <laughs> no. and all that. I, I feel like it's... Uh, no, no, no. Too weak for you as a writer. Oh, too weak oh, for you. Oh, this, you, you understand? This is, oh, this has made me so happy. You have, you have no idea how happy you just made me because as you realized, you realized, Lost is a good example that I, they probably had the polar bear worked out, but because of all of these external forces that affected the architecture of the series, the polar bear got lost. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's so true. Oh my uh, god, the lost but it's so funny. I told Chris after I watched the show for the first time, because I finished season four, and I up until that point, season four was my favorite season of the show after the first season. And then I after I finished five and six, I'm like, yeah, they should have ended it in four. Four four to me until Ben moves the island was the logical conclusion of like just where that show should have ended. Like if we're just going on our lost tangent <laughs> side note that is kind of inevitable just based on our well, individual to me, tastes. To me it just feels like and, and maybe Suja thought I love your sort of take on this being someone who's kind of seen the writer side and the actor side of, of working with a network for, for you know longer periods of time. But to me, it just kind of seems like an outsider's perspective, rather, that, you know, there was just so much battling that they had to do with the studio to just get it to a point where they could end it successfully, that there was there was there was no way they could have picked up all the pieces properly. I mean, I think the show's brilliant because they kept the mystery going till the very end, but I do think it's unfortunate that they had to deal with that added stress that I think no creator really should have to deal with, but that's when there's money involved, that's the name of the game sometimes of just, you know, we don't know what's quite happening with our creation with our baby. There's a there's a political aspect to all of these things, you know, the network is spending money so they want to say the creators are, you know, they thought it through. There's a, probably a production company that's bank, ba uh, banking, you know, bankrolling it to some degree because networks don't pay 100% of the budget. You know, they're only licensing shows. And so, you know, everybody's got a, a say in this and everybody thinks they're a genius uh, sometimes. And so, you know, it, it, given what I know, when a show works, I am amazed because there's so many moving parts and often moving parts with the best of intentions that can cause things to derail. Uh, so when you look at something like Schitt's Creek, which is just almost perfect in its execution from episode one to the end, or, you know, Fleabag or any of some of these shows that are, are really, and, and the expanse too, uh, you realize that, uh, you know, it's it's not a fluke, but there's a lot of things that just came together perfectly for to allow, you know, that kind of success to, to play out. And, you know, one wrong move in casting or one mistake in a, a creative decision, which at the time, well, you know, you look at my story about Kim's Convenience, they made a decision that they were able to pivot on, uh, luckily, but maybe, you know, if they weren't able to, and sometimes you can't because the actor has a seven, you know, I was cast in an ABC pilot and I had to sign a contract for a seven year deal, whether I got the part or not. Uh, and, you know, so if they have to pay the actor for seven years, they may live with a mistake and that show then may not last seven years. And there's a lot of horror stories about, about that. So there's a million things that can go wrong and not necessarily because you've got, 
bad actors involved. It's, you know, just things happen. Um, yeah. So, so I, I, you know, I would say that when shows are successful, celebrate them because, you know, it's so hard. Yeah. Yeah. No, what do you, what because... are you speaking of that? What, what, before we get too far away from it, um, you know, Don brought up Kim's convenience. What do you think is the magic behind Kim's convenience in your opinion? Uh, authenticity. I think that why, why Kim's, and I think this is true for a lot of successful shows. They're they're They stayed true to themselves. Uh, they didn't try to pander or, you know, be something for what they thought the audience wants. They, you know, when I started on the show, I thought this is gonna, this is a lovely little show that will uh, be successful maybe in the 416 area code. I mean, it's such a unique love letter story for this, for Toronto, but I don't know anybody in Moose Jaw who would get it really, would they? Moose Jaw, try, try uh, Indonesia. They love the show. Yeah. Uh, and yet it is so specifically authentic to that particular place and people that you couldn't transplant, you know, somewhere else. I mean, you could do a New Delhi version of Kim's Convenience, but it would have to be really New Delhiized. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you could do it. And just like The Office does that. I mean, there's, I don't know, 30 versions of The Office floating around in, in space because each country made their own version. And, and that can be done. But you have to make it feel like it's not just rewritten with for you know Italian names, but it's you know coming from that new place of authenticity. So I think that's why Kim's Convenience works is that they never lost touch of the, what makes it authentic. Yeah, it's crazy because like I mean just, just about Kim's like I I told my like my cousin, but I, I made a post about Kim's like me finally watching the show on my Facebook and my cousin who like I never in a million years thought would have stumbled up. He's like, oh, I love this show. And I text him, I'm like, hey, just so you know, we're 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 interviewing two people for the show. And he's like, oh, cool, which ones? And I, and I told him who, and he was freaking out because he knows like every character on the show. But no, back to your point about like kind of whenever you have a good TV show celebrate it. It's funny because I'm actually launching a separate spinoff podcast of this uh, called Talking Thrones in about a month in order to celebrate Game of Thrones for a 10 year anniversary. And I kind of want to break down that show and kind of like figure out what went wrong specifically towards the end. But like I've, ever since that show ended, I've been getting into so many different shows. Like, after I finished Game of Thrones, I watched the, I finished The Wire for the first time. I really got into Mad Men. I got into The Americans. I'm getting into The Leftovers. The other, the, the other thing I would say is it's not just, I mean, the reason that there is an authentic uh, execution of a successful show tends to be because there is a, I wouldn't say there's a singular vision, but there's a cohesion, a cohesive vision. So, like I used to write for the Muppets, and and Fraggle Rock was successful in, in its time um, because everybody who worked on that show was executing uh, a very particular vision. You know, we weren't all doing our own version of something; we were doing that show, and we bought into that vision. And there were a lot of writers that dreamed of writing for the Muppets and, and were given the opportunity and they never succeeded because they couldn't buy into, I mean, they wanted to, but they weren't able to buy into the vision of the show and execute something that was consistent with that, with that vision. So I, I think that's, that's, those are the two keys. It's, a, it's having a singular vision and executing it authentically. And if you can have that happening, then I think you have a, a chance at a successful show. And I'm also kind of getting some of that old adage of there's no I in team. You know, which Correct. I think obviously is self-explanatory, but I mean, you know, there's every movie has thousands of names at the credits, but why do some go on to live forever and some kind of live and die in that moment that they're released? In fact, I would say when you have somebody who believes that they are the visionary, that's a two season show. If you have somebody who uh, embraces the collaborators to execute their vision, then you have a four, five, six season show. Yeah, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly, especially since you've you've had some sh certain shows that end up switching showrunners halfway through, and then the the new showrunner comes in, and it's like a breath of fresh air, and it feels like you're watching a whole new show, and the show could be like, I, I remember that was a big thing with Veep, 
where Veep, Armand, Ar I know Armando Anucci left that show after season four, I think. Right. And the new showrunner that came in for season five was one of the guys who worked on Curb Your Enthusiasm. And I heard that it was like, it gave that show like a whole new surge for its last couple seasons, you know? Yeah, except that the other thing is it was a seamless transition. That's because it. I think, I think, um, I forget his name, David, uh, the, the second David show. David Mandel, right? David That's Mandel. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I think he had written for um, Beat before he became the showrunner, but he wasn't the showrunner. And you're right, Armando Anucci was, and he left. But I think there was a seamless overlap of those of, of them. And that, again, the singular vision wasn't dependent on one person. It was a vision that, you know, existed, Right. Like right. That show was so clearly thought of, thought through and so clearly defined and so authentic, you know, it was particularly specific. You know, as soon as you turn on Veep, you know, it's a Veep show, right? It's not yeah. the West Wing, right? right? They're both political drama, you know, comedy dramas in a way uh, set in Washington, D.C., but you don't, you don't, you can just look at the frame and you know which one is which. Exactly. That's how specific they are. And it's that specificity and authenticity and singular vision that enables any creative to then decide whether they can be a part of it, you know? So, so on Veep, there, David Mandel didn't write every episode, right. but everybody who wrote under David Mandel or everybody who wrote under Armando Iannucci wrote within that uh, vision. So when I wrote Fraggle Rock, you know, Jerry Jewell was our showrunner. And, you know, I had to make sure that I was executing Jerry Jewell's show. Uh, but it was still my script. I wrote every word of every draft of my scripts. We didn't have the, the room that they have on shows now. We were each individually responsible for our episodes. And, and you know, it was creative collaboration in that Jerry and, uh, you know, rubber stamped everything that I did. But he did. It didn't go through his computer, right? So I was able to buy into his vision and execute a vision, and yet still tell a story that only I could tell. So people who know the show really well, at least the people who worked on the show, could always tell. Oh, that's a Sujit script. Oh, that's a David Young script. Oh, that's a BP Nickel script because of the ideas and themes and specifics. But they were all Fraggle Rock scripts, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and, no, and, absolutely. And, and that is. That's a hard thing to execute because it's not like you can uh, do it mechanically. It comes from who's involved. I mean, Jerry Jewell, if you ever met Jerry Jewell, he was this special person. You know, he's like a David Mandel or any of these sort of great showrunners who's able to be, who's able to, to, to define a singular vision and then uh, make sure that the collaborators who came in on that singular vision were able to do it. And if you were, then you're part of the family. And if you weren't, then you couldn't be part of the family. Right. Yeah, no, it, it's true. Like, I, I've heard that and how that story's been told about, like, again, David Chase and what he was able to pull off with The Sopranos and how yeah. that eventually, like, kind of triggered you. You're still seeing the trickle-down effects of it, of what The Sopranos did today, like, just all and all of that. And everyone has talked about just, again, like, how, you know, you know effectively how David oversaw every single decision there. So... I wanted to, so I wanted to kind of walk through kind of like the process because again, so you you you've been in the writers' room, you've been both behind the scenes and on set. So I guess kind of walk us through the process as far as like, so you get to work as far as like like for for the for the let let's say for the writing process per se. So you get to work right, you work on your script, you submit it. Like I just walk us through the process of like getting the words on the page to seeing your words on the screen. Like well, like walk us through that process. Well, my experience is a bit dated in that there was no writer's room when I wrote. I wrote a lot of television in the 80s and 90s, uh, and it wasn't the writer's room back then. Uh, it was a freelance kind of situation. And the process then, and it's similar now, the only difference is that now the whole team of writers assists in breaking down the season, in defining what's going to happen over the episodes. Right. When I did, uh, when I was doing primarily television writing, uh, the showrunner did that. Uh, and they would plug my script in, in the right spot. But the episodes weren't particularly serialized. I mean, there was an overall arc, but it wasn't like like a Lost, where each episode you got to watch right. the order. Um, 
Do you know so when, 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 case, when that change started to co started to commence? Like the transition really, was more free. Really to around started? the year two. I mean, it was in place in LA for a long time, but it really, um, you know, moved into the Canadian uh, uh, television scene around the year 2000, the year 98, 99, 2000. Sounds when about I, right. When you have like X-Files yeah. starting to have yeah, different little bits trickle from episodes. comes on the scene. Sex yeah. in the City's on the scene. Like well, the whole television real, thing is shit. have a real writing room. But in either case, besides breaking down the season, the other thing is, uh, the difference is that now the credited writer may not be the person who actually wrote, wrote the script. When I was working, the credited writer was the only person who wrote the script. Uh, so that's changed. Like I, I was through, went through that transition. I wrote uh, for a series called Blue Murder. And uh, that was around that 1999, 2000 era. And so I would get rewritten uh, by the other, the, by the showrunner, but I still get the sole writing credit. Yet, I mean, it was pretty much what I wrote, but not exactly. Whereas when I was writing Fraggle Rock, which was in the 80s, every word was mine. And from the time it got to the screen. So the process in either case was you have to come up with an idea for an episode. Um, and you pitch that idea to a showrunner. I, I used to write, uh, I wrote for a series called Blobheads and it was a animated uh, live action combination kids show. But these, this kid who had a pair of aliens who uh, <clears throat> turned up in the bathroom in his room because that was their that was their uh, transition portal to their uh, planet was that's uh, awesome. Nice. It was a funny idea, and uh, and the showrunner uh, was uh, a, a friend of mine, uh, uh, and and I came in with twelve ideas for an episode, and I said, um, okay, so I'll start with my favorite, and he stopped me. He says, don't ever say that. I said why? Because what if it's not my favorite? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not that right. point. No, it's not. Now I have uh, one last uh, question in this in this sort of area that we're in. Um, before I do want to obviously jump into the expanse and sort of talk about that a little bit as well. Uh, th the serialization of television, you know, that I guess we all kind of kind of just stood together came out in like the late '90s, early 2000s. Do you think that? you know, maybe there wasn't a need for the, the writer's room that you hear so much about now back in the days of more procedural, uh, you know, co oriented content, or are you kind of envious that you didn't have that experience of sort of the hive mind of building it out together and getting a feel for, you know, your, your fellow, you know, staff members and then going off on your own and sort of adding your stamp to that specific section? Well, I don't know if I'm envious, um, I, I kind of, you know, had my own experience, and that experience was having both the responsibility and credit for my scripts be mine. Um, and now I don't think TV writers even have that experience. So they have a different one, um, and it's an interesting one. Uh, I'm not, you know, I think your point was interesting because so many more shows now are. Uh, serialized versus when I was writing television where things really were more episodic. I mean, the only thing that was serialized really that you had to watch in order were soap operas. Uh, you, you didn't really watch prime time. You didn't have to watch prime time in order because there was no binging. You watch one episode a week, if, you know, and the next one wasn't going to show up until a week later. So it was almost stupid to serialize because what if somebody missed an episode? You know, then they would, you would get letters, uh, not emails. There was no email back then. Nope. You get letters. I had to write letters. <laughs> right. And uh, so, so episodic was so really what television was. I mean, they and the network didn't want to have to show episodes in a certain order. They wanted the freedom to be able to do whatever they wanted because what if it get preempted? What, you know, all sorts of things. And back then there were so few networks. It wasn't 500 different networks. There were four you know, or five or whatever. So it, it's, a, it's a very different thing. The one thing I will say is that it was wonderful to be part of that era and to do that kind of writing. Um, and I think it's just as wonderful to be part of the modern era and do that kind of writing, but it is very different. Hmm, very interesting. Yeah, uh, you know, so we've kind of covered both aspects of your career. Uh, is there one where your heart feels more drawn to than the other? Was one more out of necessity to sort of survive and make a living? Or 
if you had your pick, you wouldn't change anything. You would both write and direct and act. Well, I suppose if I had to choose, I'd prefer to direct more because that's the okay. most fun. Writing is really hard. <laughs> It's really hard. Me. I, I, I can say that from personal experience. It is. And, I, I'm gonna go one step further. Writing is a bitch. It is so it, bad. It, it's really hard. I'm writing a a feature now. It's in in development anyway. And you know, I stare at the screen and I'm going, "Why am I doing this? This is so hard." Just you know, if I'm an actor, they just give me the script and I you know I can go off and do it. It's it's fun. Um, but you know, the hard part about acting is getting the job. Uh, uh, anybody can become a writer. You just have to start and wait until beads of blood pop out on your forehead while staring at a computer screen. But that's I've been there. <laughs> that's that's writing, right? Uh, you may not get paid for it necessarily, but if you keep at it, you will eventually. You know. Um, so you know. I mean, it's it's um, everybody's going to have their own story. You know, every you guys are going to have your own story, and. It's impossible. Like I, I, I see online, you know, these questions from aspiring writers or aspiring actors, even seeking the right the sort of the, the correct path that you sort of take to become a working professional in the business. And what I say is, there is no correct path because no working professional ever got to take it. Every working professional I know has their own story. Yep. Somebody is the nephew of a producer, and that's why they're, <laughs> you know, on a show. Somebody else clawed their way through and, you know, cold called everybody they could. And I know people who literally had no experience and cold called their way and became professional writers from cold calling. And then somebody else was like me who kind of had a bit of a sample and then had the luck of being in a school that had a producer double you know uh, uh moonlighting as a as a prof and got my script to him and then he got it to the network and i was able to you know got got the chance to pitch and if my pitch had sucked i would be selling insurance for you know, <laughs> years later, you know? so yeah, yeah. Who knows? i mean it's just it's just such a fluky business the only thing i can say is it doesn't Luck is important, but it doesn't happen because of luck. It happens because you prepared and you worked really hard and you had that sample script ready to go when you entered the elevator with Steven Spielberg. You know, you, you had uh, the skill set to being an actor when the network calls twice and says, okay, you know what? We screwed up the first time. We'll recast and put him in the part. And you're able to deliver, uh, you know, and so getting back to The Expanse, for example, you know, it's a shame that you haven't seen it, but I'm in the last half of season five. When I was cast, I auditioned for, with dialogue from season two, not my character at all. And and uh, and they liked what I did with that. So then they invited me to audition for uh, the showrunner and the the pilot. I mean, the uh, the episode director, and brought in an actor to read opposite me. And then they gave me, you know. The, the, the piece of text or the script from the ad app, the real episode. And that was the first time I even saw what they were looking for in terms of content, right? And they cast me and I shot that episode. And then two episodes later, I get that, this new episode. And if you see the series, you go, holy shit, how did they know I was going to be able to pull this off? Because it's such a leap content wise and, and requiring acting skills that they didn't know I had or they didn't see in the first episode I did. But they, and the same thing happened on this show that I do now called Transplant. When I was first was cast, I got to do the first two episodes and there was, you know, I'm, I'm sort of play the senior surgeon who crushes dreams. And I had no idea where they were going to take that character and I'm in the show. Right. And and by the time the 10th episode script showed up and I read it, and I went, what? Oh, my God. And I went to the showrunner. I said, Joe, thank you. This is amazing. I had no idea you were going to go here. I mean, this is how and Joe is like that. He doesn't he likes to keep things close to his chest in terms of. And, and you know what? It worked. I mean, here we are. So 
you never know how these things play out. You just have to be ready. Absolutely. And by ready means trained, prepared, professional, the right attitude, uh, able to deliver, even though you didn't know you'd have to. Like I said, getting back to The Expanse, that second episode I'm in had, requires acting stuff that I had no idea would I would. I mean, I knew I could do it, but I didn't know they knew I could do it. And yet they wrote it. That's yeah. impressive. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I was literally just hearing a story about this on the podcast today about like kind of directors almost making actors think that they've made certain choices when in reality they're just like baiting them towards those certain choices in order to kind of get what they want. But that, again, that just shows that like when a creator is good and they know what they're doing, like this, see, this is the result the you get. Particularly in television, but it's true for movies too. Uh, there's an there's an illusion that the director is, you know, casting. direct. Well, he's casting, but directing the performance. The responsibility for the performance is mine. Right. You know, nobody's going to tell me. I mean, it's not a it's not an attitude thing. It's they, it, it, they don't want to have to tell you how to act. They want you to do that. They right. want you to. To bring all of that stuff because it's not their job it's your job right you know you don't and i learned this a long time ago i did a movie with dennis hopper the great dennis hopper oh rest in peace that guy you know and the director apparently who cast me was fired shortly after they started shooting and it was a young guy who i don't think has ever directed anything since Ouch, yeah. and they brought in uh the the the, the cinematographer who was a very well-known cinematographer he worked on alien and bunch of other movies he ended oh, up wow. directing he ended up directing the film and i realized because i i do this scene with dennis hopper y you don't direct dennis hopper right you know dennis hopper can direct himself thank you very much yeah <laughs> he did right? in, in the movie that made him famous you know right. right so so you realize that's how it works you know you're not i mean it's not community theater where the, the you know the director is trying to mold performances out of amateurs who don't know how to act in, in our business, everybody should be able to do the job, and that's what they're hiring you to do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, Accountability that, that, seems that's, to be... That, that's 100% right. And because the other thing, too, that I've heard is that... Um, just uh, what's it called? The number one thing that a, that a director never wants to do is tell an actor how to do their job, and vice versa. You know, when I direct, I don't want to have to do that. Exactly. That's not first of all, it means that I have either cast the wrong person if they're not sort of doing it. Um, or, which is bad enough, because that's on me, or uh, the actor hasn't hasn't done their homework to, to, to know what this scene is, uh, calls for. Now, if that's the case, you know, we try and fix that by explaining what's going on in the scene. But I remember once um, one of my mentors, I, you know, I was at the Canadian Film Center as a director, and one of my men mentors was Dan Petrie Sr., and he directed all sorts of great films like Raising the Sun and, you know, The Clockmaker and all these oh, fantastic wow. movies. And uh, as an exercise, they had brought in a couple of actors to do a scene with a crew, and, and I was supposed to direct this. And uh, Dan stood at the back watching and making notes. And... Uh, and I ran over to the actor at one point. I said, and I was having trouble. I couldn't explain what I wanted. And I said, do you mind if I give you a line reading? And he was fine. He said, yeah, sure. So I gave him the line reading and then we went on. So at the lunch, at the postmortem at lunch, Dan Petrie Sr. gets up and says, don't you ever fucking do that again. And I said, why not? I was able to get the take. And he says, if you had gone to the actor and said, can I give you a line reading? What if he'd said no? Then True. you're authority as a director is completely shot you might as well go home and the crew will just continue on doing this without you because you don't have any credibility left so you got to find a better smarter way to get what you want out of that actor than saying can i give you a line reading so that's wow. when i realized oh that's my job as an actor it's not the director's job to you know do that and and that's where i get where i get to this thing where you know, it's all the same job, directing, acting, writing. It's all storytelling. It's all storytelling. And that's a sort of an aspect of the overlap on the professional side. I don't want to be given a line reading as an actor because that means I'm screwing up or the director screwed up in some way. And it's going to create tension on, on the set. And that's you don't want that. You want a collaborative, a collaborative uh, atmosphere, not a, 
kind of, ooh, am I making a mistake atmosphere, right? right. And so, so there's a lot of these kinds of balls that, that are in the air when you're, when you're working in the business. And, and the people who work in the business over time are the people who understand how to keep those balls in the air. And the people who don't work in the business over time don't understand how to keep those balls in the air. Yeah, no, for sure. 100% true. Now, I, I, we, we, we're running short on time here, but I do have sort of at least one last question for you for me. With your experience, you know, wearing so many different hats over the course of your career, The Expanse, there's a I lot of space. A, a I was about edition. to say, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> very very good pun right you there. You cannot buy this in a store. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Crew. Yeah. That's, That's awesome. Crew. That's awesome. You cannot buy this hat. Okay. Wearing the hat. Go on. Yeah, no, because I was going to say there's a lot of science fiction shows, and I think with the advent of streaming, we've gotten a lot more. But this show, it seems to stand out amongst the rest. The Expanse. I have a film. We're, we're friends with our former film professor, who's who went to NYU for writing, and he watches a lot of sci-fi. He does not talk about a lot of the sci-fi he watches, but he talks about The Expanse quite a bit. What do you think is the magic of this show? In your in your opinion, they don't mess with the science, for one thing. There's no beam me up. There are no aliens per se. All of the, even the um, the spaceships and how they they execute them visually is scientifically accurate and correct. Uh, you know things like when the when a spaceship and the expanse fires a gun, uh, they make sure that the the engine fires thrust just before the gun goes off so that. Otherwise, the gun would force a spaceship to go shooting, you know, 5,000 meters in the other direction. They can't do that. Now, Star Wars, they're breaking every science rule that exists. So that that show appeals for a whole other reason. So that's the first thing, I think, is that The Expanse doesn't mess with the science. The second thing is The Expanse is based on these really great books. So what it's about has been thought through by the original book writers for a long time. So they are playing the long game on that show and they're seeding all of this stuff that they know where the show is going. We may not as we watch the show, but it's really engaging as we see it unfold. And then by the time you get to season four and you realize, holy crap, that was seeded in season one. I remember that. And now it's playing off in season four. I mean, when you got that kind of stuff going on, plus the science is accurate, it's a fantastic and you know it's great characters. The, the the even my character it surprises you, and and you don't see what I end up doing coming. And that applies to almost every character. I mean, it does apply to every character on that series, but particularly the 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 series leads, the the ones the shows telling the story about. You know where they start, and as they unfold, you just get more and more connected to them because of how interesting and how moving and how engaging they are as, as characters. So I think those are the three components and that's hard to pull off, but it, the expanse does it. No, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm just from what I, the little of that I've seen of the show, like I can already tell I'm like, yeah, this is, this is setting itself apart. It's funny because I'm not, I, I will definitely say that like so, certain of the TV shows, certain of the new TV shows that I saw from the last couple of years were starting to disappoint me as far as I'm like, oh, I feel like this isn't living up to like just the, such this rich potential that the first half of the decade kind of set up. But now I'm seeing a lot of cool shows like the, like I, I just watched The Expanse, uh, a show that Chris and I just got into, uh, this Apple TV show called For All Mankind. A yeah. lot, lot of Brilliant. new and interesting, like the kind of getting back to like kind of what the, the different storytelling possibilities that TV had, is capable of because I actually it's funny I was this is another point that I've brought up on multiple different podcasts which is that the thing that I don't like which is something that I, I will directly point the finger to Netflix has done quite frequently is I don't like when a show ends not prematurely but ends before it feels like it's had a chance to tell its complete story like I don't think that every show needs to go on like seven or eight seasons you know I, I just just certain so a lot of the stories just aren't meant to last that long you know yeah. and in fact a lot of the reason why we a lot of the tv that we enjoy kind of ends up going down is because like it kind of falls into that trap of just kind of going on longer than like the storytelling allows for it so kind of I guess just the, the thing that I really enjoy about certain shows is that I like how they're able to kind of take those storylines and fold them and make them 
kind of, you know, long term, but important, you know, and like when you see details in later seasons that pay back to earlier seasons, you know, stuff that like makes that, that, that doesn't like kind of satisfy your own personal view, but like makes the story worth it because it makes it feel like, okay, yes, all these hours that I put into this, this is engaging and this is investing, you know, and this is worth getting into it. That's, I'm, I'm really, I'm already getting this sense from The Expanse, which I'm, I'm really, really excited about because it's something I haven't gotten from a show in quite a while. Well, I remember when I was writing Fraggle Rock, you know, we, we did 96 episodes over four seasons. And um, when it was ending, it wasn't because we were canceled. Uh, Jim decided 96 was enough. And so what that did was back then, and this is, you know, in the late 80s, it's before we, you know, back then shows just got canceled. And did, this ended. But we were able to uh, write uh, an ending. Right, we had four or five. The last four or five episodes were building to a conclusion, quote unquote. Not a, not a, you know, a final ending, but at least a satisfying payoff in a way. And that was unheard of back then. But we were able to do that because we knew that ninety six was going to be the last episode. So we each, as writers, got to do our one final one, and that was sort of a summation of our particular interest in the show. And it was really great. So I and the last day I asked Jim, I said, you know, why do you end? Because I love doing this show, and I could have done it forever. And I said to Jim, I said, well, why are you ending it? And he said, it's time. Yeah. Wow, yeah. And and, well. and that was and that and I and that took my breath away, because he had the creative confidence to say. First of all, I don't need the job, so I'm going to take this creative train that I set in motion four seasons ago and let it end and let everybody be part of that and move on to the next thing. And, and it, it just moves me still that it wasn't any more complicated than that. It's time. Yeah. That's that's that 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 I feel like the, if that doesn't perfectly sum up Jim Henson as a person, then I don't know what does because like just yeah because no, no you're right because like and it's funny because it feels like I almost like a lot of the shows that we see now are like kind of almost like more so hesitating towards that because again one of the things that set Breaking Bad apart is that Vince Gilligan said that like yeah he knew exactly where he was going to end Walter White's w w with Walter White and that's what made the ending of Breaking Bad like so impactful and like David Chase like he knew where he was going to end with The Sopranos as early as season 5 and there were like three more seasons of that show afterwards. And it's almost like all of these new show creators and showrunners that are pitching these shows. And again, I'm, I'm binging and just the internet and technology has a lot to do with this. They were, again, it's like the idea of no, you're not just like throwing something out there and then it's just going to last for as long as it does until it gets canceled. It's like, no, you're telling a story. And it has a beginning, and it has a middle, and it has an ending. It may take longer than like a two-hour movie, but... Like, the, they, this is still a story, and these still things need to happen in order for this to be, like, kind of the rich, fulfilling experience overall I, that television should be. I think that that <clears throat> approach is much more common now. Uh, and the, the, um, the trick is getting to do it. Right. So, like, The Expanse was canceled after three seasons. Right. On sci-fi. On sci-fi. Sci and, and that was a real tragedy because... The story wasn't over, right? And and thankfully, it got picked up by Amazon, and so now they can tell the full story, right? Exactly. No, you're, and you're, you're, and so so you know, I think that the approach is more like what you're talking about now. Every showrunner has a beginning, middle, and end in mind, and the challenge is to get to, to the finish line, right? Exactly. No, it, it's so funny For because sure. Chris and I have talked about this nonstop, but we are forever going to be angry at Netflix for canceling Glow before they put out their fourth and final season. Because, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, because it, it, it was one thing, it would have been one thing if that show wasn't as beloved as it was, right? And it just ended. But it's the fact that not only was it beloved and not only was it just a good show, but they had the fourth season. They were ready to go as far as production. Yeah. And then that got yeah. shut down because of COVID. And it's, and, Sure, it may not have had the numbers to justify it, but it was the last season. And but Netflix pulled the plug before they could like finish out their last season. Like that's the, the roadmap type of kind was of, there, right? That's the type of like kind of corporate think pro thought process, I guess. That just I I just don't understand. But that's only because I'm not well, in that position. You no, know? That, that that's above my pay grade too. But 
you look at a show like Veep and how successfully they were able to end it. Right. They knew where they were going in that last episode. Or The Good Place is another one. Yeah, Good where, Place is a great example you know, of a recent like example. They were able to tell the whole story. And then those final episodes, and, you know, MASH was the first one that really right. did this, right? Those final episodes, you know, the whole world is, watches them because yeah. they want to see how this is going to, to, to end. And it when it works like on the good place or veep or mash for that re- for that yeah, matter the americans another good really good yeah, reason to yeah, exactly. end a show like it just it, it this is why i love television it, yeah. it it fills your heart it's like the best movie in the world because you've been on the you've been watching that movie for 4 years yeah right and, and that's exactly where i've always approached it from i went to film school being like not laughed at by my fellow students but kind of looked at in weird ways by just being the guy who was like well i mean movies are are great but i I don't want to just work on this character for for hours and years and throw him away in two hours i want to live with this guy you know when i was in film school and when i started my career tv was disposable right that was the problem now tv is permanent Mm mm-hmm yeah, and it's argue, there's an argument to be made that TV is now more valuable than movies. You can't see all the stuff that I did in the in the early '80s and you know '90s. They don't exist, and you'd have to go into the archives of the network to to watch them. But now, television lives forever, and it lives on multiple platforms. And it you can you know I missed Schitt's Creek watching it week by week when it was on CBC. I'm finishing binging it now. You know, watching half a season and in the evening kind of thing. And it's the best experience ever. And, and, and it exists. And, and you know, my knee and my niece will be able to watch it five years from now. They're not, they're not, they're not disposable anymore. And that's the great thing about us in this modern era of television. Television has a weight to it and it has a permanence to it. So, you know, it breaks my heart that the stuff I did, I mean, I'm so glad that, that um, Fraggle Rock, for, for decades was lost, right? It, it existed as a DVD set, but who watched that, right? And then it got remastered for um, uh, HD. I mean, we shot it in a quasi HD back then, but it wasn't screened that way on, uh, initially. But they remastered it properly for HD, and HBO Family showed it, and Amazon around the world showed it, and now it's on Apple, Pl- Apple TV+. Plus. Multiple platforms, three years running. The whole world can watch what I did 30 years ago. Yeah, it's crazy. I, just, I mean, that's incredible to me. Uh, it doesn't exist for some of the Canadian shows that I did back then. But now creators and writers are making shows that will live on Netflix or wherever for decades. Who knows? Yep. Right. It's it's 100 percent true. Yeah. Now, uh, one last question that I have to ask before we get out of here uh, is that. Oh, uh, I think Chris got bounced. Um, what's it called? Is that um, have you watched Community? Yes. Okay. So now my question that, that died too soon. Yeah. That you. you I, I. Oh man. I. I could not agree with you more on that. Just as far as all that goes. But so I. I wanted to read you a quote that actually. Um. You. You made. You watched the whole thing, right? When it came back to Netflix. Uh. Not the Netflix. I mean, I watched the initial network uh full amount right yeah because it ran for the five seasons on nbc and then it got canceled but then yahoo tv picked it up for the last season so in the final final episode that aired on yahoo because yahoo the last three seasons were 13 episodes and yahoo picked it up for that last season of 13 episodes and abed in the last episode had this quote that just i feel like perfectly sums up the experience of tv which is that his quote is there's a skill to it More importantly, it has to be joyful, effortless, and fun. TV defeats its own purpose when it's pushing an agenda or trying to defeat other TV or being proud or ashamed of itself for existing. It's TV. It's comfort. It's a friend you've known so well and for so long you just let it be with you. And it needs to be okay for it to have a bad day or phone in a day. And it needs to be okay for it to get on a boat with LeVar Burton and never come back. Because eventually it all will. And... If that doesn't sum up TV in a nutshell, I don't know what does. So, well, I, I mean, I agree with what he's saying, but remember that he's talking about a show, Community, that executed on a very high level. That is true. So, that so is their, true. their bad day is most other shows, uh, uh, Emmy Award uh, nominated. Right. Actor, okay. Exactly. And I was talking to the director where I'm shooting tra- Transplant now, and Transplant's one of these shows where, you know, there's a whole phenomenon now where uh, the, the fans live tweet while the episode is airing. And I realized watching the live tweets when the show airs, I was telling the, the director the other day, I said, 
the problem with this show now is that every scene's got to be a winner because yeah. they're live tweeting as we as it shows. So every scene's got to be a winner. Yeah. You can't yeah. just have a scene where we phone it in. Every scene's got to be a winner. So the, the stakes are much higher now. But what I like to think is that the execution is also much higher because we've got an industry that's been doing this for a long time. We've got all the talent in the world. And we'd also have, finally, we're sort of having the production values that didn't exist when I was starting out in television. Now the production values are, you know, much greater than what feature films were. So yeah. there's no, there's, you know, it's still hard, but it's, it's, it's really satisfying now because we can do it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and the, again, it's just the, the things that they're doing on TV now and just what they're able to do. And again, like I was saying this back in 2016, like we got Battle of the Bastards, which 20, 30, 20, 30 years before that would have been um, friggin uh, w would have been like a movie that was that was Braveheart 20 to 30 years before. And now we have Battle of the Bastards on an HBO show on a Sunday night. You know, it's it's crazy. Just what, what we're able to get now. Uh, we're, we're living in a golden age. Uh, of television, and, and frankly, I think television and movies have now merged into one thing, right? We're all watching them on a flat screen, on an iPad, or on a wall, or somewhere in our house. I, I mean, the, for me, the big tragedy is whether we'll go back to a movie theater anytime, uh, because yeah. that experience yeah. is a whole other thing. But mm -hmm. within the world that we've got now, uh, post COVID, which is, you know, home screening, it's, it's as good as it, I, I mean, how can it get any better? I mean, we've got surround sound, we've got the, uh, the flat screen, or you can be in the bathroom and watch it on your phone. Like who cares? <laughs> you know, For in sure. the olden days, you have to huddle around this TV in the living room. It doesn't no more. It's, well, it, you know, we, we, it's a, it's magic what we're, we're living through now. We don't even know it because I know it because I'm old. Um, but what you guys are having now that you can take for granted blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that 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 is the that is the I, I guess the the perk of, of being a millennial slash Gen Zer now in the world. For but, sure. Uh, yeah, Chris, you have anything else you want to ask him before we jet on out of here? Um, no, Sujith, it was an honor. It was a pleasure. Uh, we really appreciate you spending some time with us. And before we let you go, uh, is there anything that we missed along your journey? Any final, really, just pieces of wisdom with the way this conversation went that you want to impart on us? And of course, let us know what people can expect and where they can find you on the internet to keep up to date, man. Well, I don't know if I have any wisdom to impart that I haven't imparted already, but uh, just uh, to let you know that uh, we're shooting season two of Transplant now, and hopefully that'll be on in the fall, um, season five of The Expanse streams now on Amazon Prime, and season five of uh, Kim's Convenience streams now on Gem in Canada and should come to Netflix around the world uh, uh, probably in April-ish. Don't hold me to that, but I, I think that's what it's going to be. And, uh, you know, I'm really glad you asked me to, to do this because it was fun, and you guys have uh, – I love your enthusiasm <laughs> because, you know – I mean, you do this kind of stuff, and and um, not that we aren't enthusiastic on the job, but to meet people who love what we do uh, as much as we love doing it, it's great. So thank you for asking me to do this. Absolutely, dude. It is it is an honor and a privilege, sir. And, and we hope that this isn't the last time that you'll be back. We hope definitely that you like to come back. We tell this to every one of our guests. We're like, the first time, that's the professional interview. Then when you come back next time, that's when the yuck yucks. That's when the next time you come on, you're you're not like an interviewee. You're just a friend, and we just have you on, and we and we, and we chat, and we go and we go hard because I mean, you you've been in the business for a long time, so I, I assume that again, you know, you love movies. So, you know, that's probably like what you know. I'm, I'm sure you grew up watching movies. Movies, you know and that that kind of was my last question for you before we got out of here is um so technically three questions so favorite movie favorite tv show and then what's something that you've watched recently that you have not worked that you have not been associated with that you really really enjoyed uh lawrence of arabia all right uh veep nice uh schitt's creek Awesome. Nice. Perfect. Cut and dry. Nice. Very and, cool. Uh, yeah, that, that was awesome. Again, that, thanks once again to Sujith for being on. This was an absolute. It breaks my heart that I was show. never in Shit's Creek, though. Oh yeah, I was about to say. I'm like, come on. I was about to. I was about to ask. I'm like, were you ever in that show? But no. you were. Damn. They they missed out. As far as I'm concerned, they yeah, missed out. For real. So yeah. that yeah. show is. 
That is showbiz <laughs> for you. Exactly. So, yeah. So, before we get out of here, people, of course, we are the Talking TV Podcast. Thanks once again to Sujith for being in here for being here with us. This was an absolutely incredible episode. Another incredible interview. Chris, how, how have we been able to lock down this many awesome interviews since in, in like, two months? How have we been able to do this? How has this happened? Uh, I'm thankful to our community. I'm first of all thankful to the creators who we've been able to, uh, in this case, pick their brains and and you know gain some knowledge and perspective from. And honestly, man, I'm just thankful to have an outlet to sort of ask the questions that other other interviewers don't get to ask or think to ask. So if you guys like this type of stuff, you know, Sujith is obviously a really nice guy. We've had other amazing guests, guys. It only gets better if you hit that subscribe button and continue to support this show. Because to be honest with you, we wouldn't be doing this on midterms week, at least for me, if we didn't love it. And uh, it's because of you guys that sort of gives us the life force to keep pursuing this and, you know, chopping down each tree that gets in our way when it comes to this show. But I do love the environment. So maybe that was a bad example, but you know, was, whatever. Look, look, we, 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 we'd be doing this even if we, even if we didn't, well, obviously we wouldn't, but we, we'd be doing this either way. The point is we love doing this shit too much, but you guys give us an outlet to do that. And again, you guys can let us know about what other ideas you want to see is what other guests you may potentially want to see from us by leaving a comment in the comment section below C clicking the like button clicking the subscribe button clicking the bell next with that way you guys can notify every time we put up new content we have new content that we put up every mondays wednesdays and friday this week is going to be a busy week for us because chris uh well soon as i don't know how if you were familiar with this but it is my co-host's birthday on wednesday gonna be uh happy gonna be, birthday yes gonna, <laughs> thank gonna you be man the big two seven right there so we're gonna be doing a big uh fun birthday anniversary live stream on wednesday night that's gonna be a lot of fun it's gonna be super fun it's gonna be super chill super casual uh there, there there might be some drinking involved we're not sure but there's gonna be a ton of fun we're gonna be talking about all sorts of stuff like like chris we've used previous live streams in order to kind of break down things that maybe you didn't know about me but now we're gonna get into stuff that i don't know about you yes we've been working together a lot but there's still a lot that I don't know about you, and we are going to tackle all of that on your birthday stream. And of course, this coming Friday, it's the big shebang, people. We've all been waiting for it. We've been waiting these last eight weeks for it. The WandaVision finale officially kicks off this month of insanity of just geek nerd influx of content that we're going to get. That is all happening on this coming Friday. Again, we're getting our next... Marvel show, Falcon and Winter Soldier. Two weeks after that, we're getting the Snyder Cut this month, unfortunately. And at the end of the month, we're getting Kong versus Godzilla, guys. It is going to be an absolutely insane, jam-packed month. We're going to have a ton of content to deliver for you guys. And there's going to be just a ton of content to watch, finally, after what feels like two months of dead space. So uh, with that being said, before we get out of here, Chris, where can the good people find you online? Yeah, they can find me at Christian Ivanko. Um, I'm obviously working on my new album I've been telling you guys about over the past couple weeks, and it's, it's going really well. So if you want little updates, if you want sort of the other side of my creative uh, you know, endeavors, that's where you can find it, at Christian Ivanko. Ivanko spelled E-V-A-N-K-O. Uh, Sujith just made my birthday by doing this interview. Thank you so much. I'm a huge Kim's fan, man, and, and Mr. Meta is one of my favorite characters, and, and getting to meet the person behind these amazing characters that you play just further strengthens my love for the characters I see on screen. So thank you again so much, Sujith, for coming on tonight, man. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Absolutely. And you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Movie Nerd Reviews, all one word. But you can really find me at the place where I put in the most amount of my effort, which is the Talking TV Podcast, found on Facebook and Instagram at Talking TV Podcast, all one word. No G. That's where we post all of our stuff in order to keep you guys up to date and well informed on what it is that we have coming up. As always, people, thank you for tuning in. 12 seasons in a short film, and watch more fucking movies and TV. We'll see you guys next time.